defined as a rational individual. So we're thinking about preferences and we're thinking about choice. Do we ascribe rationality to preferences or to choices? Choices, I think, is it a rational agent is someone who acts uh, in accordance with their preferences. Yeah, that's, that's certainly more the conventional definition. Uh, when we talk about intransitive or inconsistent preferences, so it, you might make a claim that someone who had inconsistent preferences, that their preferences themselves represented some irrationality. But yeah, usually we ascribe rationality not to one's goals, but to whether we act to attain those goals. So it becomes a little bit difficult, though, if the way we're measuring one's goals is by someone's cho by someone's own choices. Right? It's almost circular. Like, if the only way I can know what your utility function is is by seeing what you choose, how do I then know if you're choosing to maximize the utility function? Uh, okay, but let's let's see what what's 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 given in the in the Osborne uh, Rubinstein test. They define a rational individual as someone who has a preference relation over any set X. So they have those complete preferences. And I assume that they're embodying uh, transitivity there. Uh, they're aware of the set of possible alternatives. Uh, I, you know, I don't think that would fall into the conventional definition of rationality. If I'm unaware, I still can be rational by conventional definition. But this, I believe, is the definition they used in, in, the, in the Osborne and Rubenstein book. Um, and but they don't say you have to be aware of every possible alternative, right? Because there's so many alternatives out there. How can I be aware of all of them? But they say that whenever I need to choose, I'm aware of the, I don't know, the relevant alternatives or the alternatives that might potentially be in my choice set. Uh, and finally, what we just said, what you just uh, said, um, Ellis, is that they always choose an alternative that is best according to their preference relation over the set of possible alternatives. And if they're... If that's represented by a utility function, they'll always choose the one that yields them the most utility in the set. Okay. Uh, so if Ratchel's preferences, this rational person Ratchel, can be represented, as we discussed before, by the utility function u. So he has this utility function u that represents his preferences. This, this is not going to be a necessary condition, but it's going to be a sufficient condition. So if these things are the case, then he will be rational by this definition. But he doesn't ha they don't, he could also be rational if he had, let's say, lexicographic preferences, which are not represented, not representable by any utility function. Lexicographic preferences, at least in, in infinite space, cannot be represented by any uh, utility function. What do you mean by an infinite space there? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that can be a little confusing. Uh, so if I have, uh, basically, if I have a number of alternatives that I could count and get to the end of that, that is finite. But if I have preferences even over this, you, this uh, interval, 0 to 1, any amount, and 0 to 1 of, you know, of the x1 good and of the x2 good, this is already infinite space. So if I have lexicographic preferences here, and there's an example in the book, that there's no utility function that can represent what we referred to before, and I don't want to go over again because we defined last time as lexicographic preferences. At least not right but today. Yeah. So good question. Okay. So if his preferences can be represented by some utility function, and if he is rational, in, in other words, what we just said, he acts to maximize according to his preferences, that his choice function will solve the problem max, or that his choice will solve the problem. You can think of it as a choice function if you think about how it changes in its arguments. Max utility of x, where x is some bundle, such that x is in his, what we'll call his feasible set A. So for instance, for a given set of prices, it might be that he could afford, uh, you know, all the points in this range. I'm sure that's the sort of problem you're, you're familiar with from your previous economics, where you have these linear, linear budget lines and and the standard budget set. Uh, okay. 
So what else did I want to talk about? about what else do I want to say about that? Um, so we would just then say that he chooses to maximize his utility function u of x. This is pretty straightforward, I guess. Under the constraint that x is in the feasible set A. And I'm sure you, you recall things like budget constraints. Could, one thing that could define the feasible set when we get to, when we get to consumer decisions, it's going to be the budget constraint. Like one way to represent a budget constraint over two goods would be that my wealth, which we call M, must be greater than or equal to my spending on those goods, where those goods, have, suppose those goods had a fixed price. Um, and this was the amount of the first good, et cetera, et cetera. This would be my expenditure on the first good, my expenditure on the second good. Uh, okay, I'm trying to remember what else I wanted to say about this. Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, this feasible set could also include elements other than wealth. It includes you only have 24 hours in a day. Um, there's some debate about what do we think utility is. Okay, so there, there's different definitions given. Some people say it's pleasure or satisfaction you get from an economic activity. Uh, but I don't know, what would be some critiques of, the, of that as a definition of utility? Or how, do you, how would you think would be a definition of utility that would be descriptive of the way that economists use it? Well, I mean, a critique would be that people don't always choose to do things that are pleasurable. Sometimes people choose to do things that are unpleasurable. For example, just to understand. Sport, exercise, sometimes people find that. Right, so it certainly doesn't have to be pleasurable in just like the standard sense or even in a measurable sense that we would see, oh, this person is, if we could get inside their brain, this person is experiencing pleasure, right? So you could say, okay, well, maybe it's not pleasure, but maybe it's some other measure of what they think is, is good for them in the short run or the long run. I mean, and you could, um, I mean, you could, there's also an argument that perhaps it's a circular concept, as, as I suggested before. Sorry, this is sort of messy looking. Um, perhaps it's a circular concept. Like, I say, what is you, so the most general definition, or the most maybe, sorry, I'm a circular thing. You might say, okay, uh, utility is the thing that people maximize, right? And what choices do people make? They make choices to maximize utility. How do we know what their utility function is? Well, we can, we can in, infer it from revealed preference. We can infer what's preferred to what from revealed preference and perhaps begin to map out their indifference curves and a set of utility functions will characterize those indifference curves. But then it sounds like I'm just saying that um, util it almost sounds circular, right? Utility function is what I maximize. How do I know what that utility function is? Well, look at what I choose. So could you add conditions to that and say, you know, utility is what would be maximized if they were ideally informed or something like that, like what, what someone would have to maximize if they had all the information about the situation they're in or, or something like so that. So that's an interesting question that would come up when we talk about behavioral economic models where they separate the utility that they that someone may actually get. And they're not saying that, that they're necessarily able to measure that. You know, maybe they maybe there's ways that they think that they can measure it better when you look at the choices they make under one circumstance or versus another circumstance. But conceptually, there could be a difference between the utility function, the utility that I achieve, the, the, and it's not just pleasure, right? It's some sort of value that I would put on it over my lifetime. So the utility I achieve and the utility function that, it, that, I'm, that I'm perhaps using or that my behavior seems to be reflecting, right? That could be like, it could be that someone's behavior turns out to be reflecting this one utility function, which is maybe impatient, whereas their actual, what they would, what they somehow actually value or, or their long-term pleasure or interest is based on this other utility function. And I guess in the conventional sense, that person is not rational in the, by this definition. Okay, let me just pause it for a second here, um, figure out what, okay, I didn't have that much to say about that topic, I suppose, so we'll move on to the next thing. Um, so do they bother, so they, do they still bother talking about rationality much in behavioral economics? Because it seems like, from what we've said, it's going to be difficult to get it to do much work. I, 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 th I think, like, they, s they, first of all, they don't like to use the concept that I, behavioral economists, I think, don't like to say rational versus irrational. Yeah. They talk about things like bounded rationality. Yeah. 
Um, and I also think that in behavioral economics, like most of the behavioral economics that's that's being, this would be nice to be on the on the mic. Uh, so uh, most of the behavioral economics that that's being done today. So we don't like to talk about. We don't say people are irrational. We say people are boundedly rational, or they have certain cognitive limits, or they're inconsistent. And also, I think most of the work now is not just trying to somehow prove that people are sometimes irrational or sometimes follow models that disagree with the classical models, but it's more about uh, f finding the evidence for the ways in which they do that and which alternative model best explains choices in different uh, contexts. So yeah, good question there. Light, but then the sun actually came out. I forgot about the, that the sun yeah, has been off for a long time. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It only comes out when you don't like it. Yeah. Right, what was the next thing that I wanted to cover? Of course, we still have time for a couple more. Dave? Cross the Alps, I believe. Oh, yeah, that's, much, that's uh, a little bit challenging. I don't remember doing this um, the public alpha. I can't yeah, remember. Maybe, maybe, maybe it'll come back to me. Maybe we'll talk about it later. Yeah. Well, have you heard of um, irrelevant alternatives or independent from irrelevant alternatives? I don't think so. Maybe I should just like have a camera ready to use my iPhone for it. You know? You can always do a bunch of editing in post, but I'm, I'm not, don't really always know how to do that. Like I have trouble separating, separating the theory of facts and things like that. Probably out. 